no. Our book opens out in the deep blue sea off the Caribbean islands, where a scientific research boat is floating off Clamshell Reef. On board is scientist Dr. George Deep, or Dr. D for short, and he's doing science stuff. You know, poking around. The book never specifies what he's doing. He's joined by his assistant, Alexander, a nice lug head who can't cook to save his life, and his vacationing niece and nephew, Sheena and Billy Deep, respectfully. Billy will be our protagonist today. He fancies himself an adventurer. He daydreams of becoming a world-famous explorer, tracking down exotic fish at the bottom of the ocean. Of course, how he imagines himself and what he's actually able to take on are two different things. Getting lost in his daydreams is a good way to, say, get sneak attacked by his sister while snorkeling, or almost getting eaten by a Lovecraftian squid beast, or, oh no, another sister sneak attack. Wait, sorry, the Lovecraftian squid beast is an actual monster that shows up at the beginning of this book and tries to grab Billy, but it doesn't actually have anything to do with the plot. For reals, there's an honest to god tentacle monster that shows up on page 9, but this book isn't about the tentacle monster at all. Oh, it has a function in the book, yes, and we'll get to that, but the sea monster of the Caribbeans is not a major character in Deep Trouble. Another oddity that never comes up and is never mentioned again is just how odd Dr. D is when he's not on the water. There's a brief anecdote about a family vacation he took and, well, here. Our uncle was miserable whenever he had to go ashore. He didn't feel comfortable unless he was on a boat. I know, because one Christmas he came to our house to visit. Usually Dr. D is fun to be with. But that Christmas visit was a nightmare. Dr. D spent the whole time pacing through the house. He barked orders at us like a sea captain. Billy, sit up straight, he yelled at me. Sheena, swab the decks. He just wasn't himself. Finally, on Christmas Eve, my dad couldn't take it anymore. He told Dr. D to shape up or ship out. Dr. D ended up spending a good part of Christmas Day in the bathtub playing with my old toy boats. As long as he stayed in the water, he was back to normal. I never wanted to see Dr. D stranded on land again. This is such a weird character quirk that you would assume that it would be the main plot of the book. Like, is Dr. D possessed by a pirate ghost or something? Is he an Aquaman villain? And it never pays off. There isn't a moment where Dr. D gets stranded on land and the kids go, oh no, we have to do something quick or our uncle is going to turn into LeChuck again. There's some really extreme red herrings in this book, is what I'm driving at. Even the cover, while accurate to a scene in the book, isn't really representative of its plot. This isn't a riff on Jaws. No, the Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards winning book Deep Trouble is a book about mermaids. While the kids are goofing off, getting hurt and catching sight of a somehow irrelevant sea monster, a boat from the marina zoo pulls up and two zoo representatives ask for a private meeting with Dr. D. Billy can't help but listen in, and overhears that a fisherman claims to have spotted what appeared to be a mermaid, and the zoo guys want Dr. D to capture it and bring it to them so that they can display it, and they're willing to pay one million dollars for a live specimen. Dr. D thinks it's mostly superstitious nonsense, but he is struggling to fund his research, so what's the harm in giving things a look? Eventually, everyone on the boat learns about this. Mermaid hunting, huh? Where do you even start? I'm not sure if Dr. D even comes up with a plan. He certainly doesn't make any actions towards mermaid acquisition, at least not before Billy gets up early in the morning to hunt for the mermaid himself. Billy grabs his snorkel and flippers and heads out to the coral reefs, which are made up of painful to the touch fire coral, which is a real thing. So I guess points to Arl Stein for finding time to do a little research. However, Billy is not alone. The book cover is also haunting this part of the ocean. Yes, the hammerhead shark. The shark with the most distinctive profile, if not exactly the most aggressive. Unprovoked hammerhead shark attacks are very rare. The International Shark Attack file only lists 17 attacks on record, none of which were fatal. Compare that to the Great White with 314 attacks, 80 of which were fatal. Which still makes a Great White shark attack statistically astronomically less likely than getting struck by lightning. And of course, it's nothing compared to what humans do to sharks. I grabbed the red coral. Pain shot through my hand. The fire coral. I didn't care. The top of the reef sat just above the surface of the water. I tried to pull myself up. My whole body stung. I had almost made it. Soon I'd be safe. 
With a mighty kick, I hoisted myself onto the reef and was yanked back into the water. My stomach slammed against the side of the reef. I felt a sharp stab of pain in my leg. I tried to pull my leg away. I couldn't. It was caught in the jaws of the shark. My mind screamed with terror. The shark. The shark. It's got me. So that raises the question of if this is a morally okay thing to do, to take an animal and grossly mischaracterize them in media. It's hardly the worst thing you could do to an animal. It's not like I'm a vegetarian here, but villainizing animals like sharks makes it easier for people to accept the harm we as a species do to sharks. You can see this play out closer to home in our cultural perception of pit bulls and the various laws and calls for extermination people have made against them for little reason. On the flip side, sharks are possibly the most dangerous non-poisonous animals you could encounter in the ocean, outside of maybe orcas, and orca attacks in the wild are even rarer, which makes sharks effective shorthand for the dangers of nature in general. I'll expand on this a bit as we go along, but one of the main themes of the book is how alien and dangerous the ocean is to people, a realm we were not invited to, and if we don't respect it, it might cause us harm which I think is a respectable message for a kid's book. I think shark attack stories are okay in a perfect world where we can separate fiction and reality. Shame we don't live there. In any case, Billy is attacked by the shark, like actually bitten with teeth and blood and stuff. This is a surprisingly violent Goosebumps book, when suddenly something scares the shark off. Hurt, Billy is assisted to safety by, drumroll please, a little mermaid. Oh well, it did not take long to find one. To my amazement, the mermaid looked just as the zoo people had said she would. Her head and shoulders were smaller than mine, but her flashing green tail stretched out, long and powerful. Her wide, sea-green eyes sparkled. Her skin gave off a pale pink glow. I stared at her, unable to speak. She's real, I thought, and she's so beautiful. So let's talk mermaids. Not exactly the scariest monster for your Goosebumps book, but they have a long and storied history, first showing up in artwork in the Babylonian dynasty around 1800 BC. One of the first mermaid stories known is from 1000 BC, where the goddess Atargatis throws herself into the sea and tries to turn into a fish out of shame of accidentally killing her lover, but she's just too dang beautiful for that and retains some of her human characteristics right off the bat, associating mermaids with beauty. Sometimes mermaids serve a similar role as sirens, using their beauty and voices to call sailors over so that they can drown them. You go, girl. But after Hans Christian Andersen wrote The Little Mermaid in 1836, we kind of settled on the idea of mermaids being a gorgeous waif that pines for the first handsome bloke they see. If there's been one consistent element to mermaids over the centuries, through legend and folk tales and media representations, is that they are something to be desired for. They're desired for their youthful beauty. Sometimes they use that beauty to trap horny sailors, yes, but more often than not, they are prizes to be won, or young maidens for the prince to marry. And if that doesn't work out, well, death is preferable for the mermaid. The mermaid in this book is described as both childlike and attractive, which isn't exactly the most comfortable combination, but it's not exactly an inconsistent image with the mermaids of old. It's evoking a desired virginity. Nobody talks about the confident, experienced 35-year-old mermaids with a dresser drawer full of vibrators and nylon rope. And of course, you're not going to have a mermaid cougar hanging out with an 11-year-old boy. My point being, Arl Stein's mermaids aren't exactly breaking the mold. Childish, sensual, and something to be possessed. She possesses some magical capabilities, like healing Billy's injuries somewhat and easing his pain. Um, okay, so I was just looking at the Deep Trouble page on the Goosebumps Wikipedia, and there's this bit near the bottom. Though the story includes a mermaid, which is a mythical creature, Deep Trouble is one of the few Goosebumps books not to include any supernatural elements and plays out more like a sea adventure story. I, uh, <laughs> I don't think the Goosebumps wiki knows what the word supernatural means. While this movie does feature Godzilla, it marks the first kaiju movie without a giant monster. Anyway, mermaids are meant to be possessed, and Billy barely gets to know his new sea girlfriend when Dr. D and Sheena sneak up and net her. 
The mermaid panics as the scientists put her into a large tank on the deck of the boat, and it's actually very distressing. We landed on a heap on the floor of the dinghy. The mermaid squirmed beside me in the net, making sharp, angry clicking noises. Dr. D watched her closely. He touched her tail. The mermaid flapped it hard against the bottom of the boat. There's a predatory quality to how the mermaid is treated, who, again, is basically a young girl. A young girl who gets abducted by a grown man who is now touching her without her consent. It's gross, especially because Dr. D isn't really the book's villain. He is at worst a misguided scientist whose curiosity results in him pawing underage girls. The mermaid curls up in a fetal position in her tank, frightened and traumatized by her abduction. Billy knows in his heart that this is wrong, but as a kid, he has to defer to the adults. Dr. D decides to take his smaller dinghy back to the mainland to try and get possible things for the mermaid to eat. I mean, I feel a selection at the local Albertsons might be a bit lacking, uh, but I guess it's better than sticking electric prods into her skin right away. And I'm sure Dr. D will come up with a better idea than Billy. Alexander reached up and unlatched the screen top. I handed him the cookie and he dropped into the tank. The mermaid watched it falling toward her through the water. She made no attempt to grab it. By the time it reached her, it was soggy. It fell apart in the tank. Billy, your heart is in the right place, but you're kind of bag of hammers dumb. With Alexander still in the ship keeping watch, Billy can't help the mermaid escape. Dr. D returns, and there's some science stuff. Night falls, and everyone goes to bed, with intent to bring the mermaid to the zoo in the morning. Billy can't sleep and is up to hear another boat quietly approach theirs. Billy sneaks up top to discover masked men dressed in black breaking into the mermaid tank, and Dr. D unconscious on the floor. They had lifted the mermaid out of the tank. Three men held her in the net. She squirmed and thrashed like crazy, splashing water all over the deck. I'll tackle them, I thought. I'll knock them over. Then I'll push the mermaid into the ocean and she can swim away to safety. Lowering my head like a football player, I took a deep breath and ran right at them. I crashed into one of the men holding the net, letting him harden the stomach with my head. To my dismay, the man hardly moved. You know what? I like Billy. In the Goosebumps protagonist pantheon, he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he's brave and he's kind and he tries to do the right thing, even if he's guaranteed failure. The only one who could save the day now is Alexander, but uh-oh, it turns out that Alexander was the one who called these guys in. It turns out the zoo isn't the only one interested in getting their hands on a live mermaid. Alexander and the crooks transferred the mermaid to their boat and locked Billy, Sheena, and Dr. D into the large tank and dumped the tank into the ocean. It looks like they might drown, but suddenly, dozens of pissed off mermaids arrive. Billy figures, not unfairly, that they're here to get revenge for kidnapping one of their own, but instead they help three humans escape the tank and bring them back to their boat. The mermaids gesture to the humans to follow them that they need to go after the boat and save the kidnapped mermaid. Dr. D is hesitant, but finally he and the kids load up in the dinghy and give chase. I'm not sure why though, because they don't actually accomplish anything. When they reach the bad guy boat, the captured mermaid is in a net tied to the side of the boat so that she can be in the water, so it's just a matter of the other mermaids getting to the net and freeing her. I guess Dr. D and the kids act as a distraction? But really, this night belongs to the mermaid's SWAT squad. The mermaid is freed, Billy and the rest get away, and the bad guys, I don't know, I guess they're just short one mermaid now. Alexander doesn't get his comeuppance, but whatever. Dr. D has learned an important lesson about capturing and terrorizing young women and ends his deal with the zoo, and all is good in the world. Billy wants to see if he can find the mermaid again to say goodbye, but when he swims out towards the reef, what should pop up again but that blasted tentacle monster? Oh, the monster was for the book and scare. I guess you can't say it wasn't established, but again, <laughs> this monster has nothing to do with anything. So that's deep trouble, and I liked it? Question mark? It's very different from the Goosebumps books we've covered thus far. The conflict is very human. The real antagonistic force here isn't the book's supernatural elements, but our senseless greed and disrespect for nature. Man is the real monster. 
Not that nature isn't scary as shit. The dangers the ocean present are constant and have little care for the intentions of man. Here for science? Here on a nice vacation? That shark doesn't care. You're just food. I perhaps throw this comparison around too much, but this is the most Lovecraftian Goosebumps book I've read thus far. The ocean presented here is full of mystery, and if Dr. D's behavior on shore was any indication, to know these mysteries is to dabble in a bit of madness. It's a good mix of actual weird things you'll find in the sea, like hammerhead sharks and fire coral, and eldritch horrors, you know, fish people and tentacle monsters. And kudos to Stein for not giving us just Disney's The Little Mermaid again. While the mermaids are clearly people, sentient beings and not animals, they're just as much alien as they are familiar, from their chirp-based language to their abilities to heal people and fight off sharks and who knows what else. The mermaid's capture here seems to invoke the human zoos resulting from European colonialism, where people from other countries or other cultures and races were displayed for the entertainment of the white masses. The book is very uncomfortable in a very deliberate way. The horror less about the monsters and more about facing a darkness in ourselves, confronting how we other people who are different from us, challenging their autonomies, touch their tails, or maybe, you know, touch their hair without their consent. There really isn't much I'd change to the plot. I'd probably beef up Sheena's part of the story, she doesn't really have a lot to say or do during all of this, but that's about it. Honestly, the main issue I have with this book is that it's written by R.L. Stein. Oh, he was on fire this time in terms of his ideas, but this book is less about action and more about mood and tone and theming. Dread of an endless ocean full of dangers, discomfort in a little mermaid girl struggling against big forceful men, panic in a shark attack. Even at his best, Stein is a surface level writer. He describes things frankly and presents action without flourish. This book feels like a really good outline to be fleshed out by a more lyrical author. As is, it's an above average Goosebumps book with some really intriguing ideas, and I have to salute it for that. I give Deep Trouble a single red rose out of 10. <laughs>